Hi guys, you know, I'm really lucky. I have static IPv6 prefixes at my home, as well as in the data center where I run dedicated server that has a virtualized firewall and some, some VM guests, containers, jails, such things. And of course, I run a VPN tunnel between those two sites, so I have my PCs, my laptops and uh, you know, stuff everybody has at home connected to the internet, but some privileged systems are able to talk to the systems at the data center over the WireGuard tunnel. And since I am relying very heavily on IPv6 and since prefixes on both sides actually are static, I have had the luxury of just integrating my hosts into the DNS system using quadruple A records, so most of the times I'm using V6 for, well, kind of everything. Another aspect of my home network is that the internet connection is, well, I would say quite okay for 2023 with a VDSL uh, vectoring connection going up to 100 megabits in downstream and 40 megabits in upstream, which is kind of... Uh, well, I would say a common line speed here in Germany. But I am double lucky because the Deutsche Telekom decided to deliver fiber connection to my home in the coming, well, year, something like that. And I'm going to switch to fiber, which will bring me up to 1000 megabits per second in downstream and up to, well, uh, 200 megabits second in upstream. It is of course a little bit more expensive but I just want to have this stuff because I like networking. I love it. <laughs> my old my old provider at home just asked for about 10 to 15 bucks per month for giving me static IP address or static prefix. Uh, the case is a little bit different with the Deutsche Telekom delivering uh, fiber they ask for the 1000 megabits per second line like 130 euros if i want it to be with a static prefix in contrast to the same line speed costing around 80 euros so i was not willing to pay the extra money like 50 bucks per month only for having a static ip address and I kept thinking, what can I do about it? I mean, there are actually some different possibilities and I really dug my head into this very topic and I think I came up with a quite okay solution. No, I think it's a really good solution and it sheds some light to the aspects of IPv6 networking, especially when it comes to the usage of ULA prefixes. So let's dive into this topic let me show you some diagrams and some some texts i've written in my blog the link is of course in the description all right here we are here you can see the differences in price if i go for the giga connection it's instead of 80 it's 130 and if i only go for the 500 megabits per second which is of course also i guess it's fine uh, it's 60 in contrast to 100, so only a price difference of 40, but still too much, I think. Here you can see a diagram about what the situation looks like right now. I have here my home network and I have a static global unicast address prefix with a size of 48. And at the data center, there is a static global unicast prefix with a size of 48 as well. And both sides are being interconnected via a WireGuard tunnel, which is a really nice thing because it is performing very decently. And I want to keep it like that in a way. But what options are there? My first thought was to use DHCP v6 and just give all my clients dynamic addresses. And every time a client asks for a new IP address, it will send a DNS update, update to my DNS servers. So uh, that way my hosts in my home network would not be static anymore, but at least I would have DNS records 
that would all the time point to my hosts. I would not have to install dynamic DNS clients on every single host as there are some hosts like printers and stuff that do not come with those stuff. But for example in OPN Sense there is an integrated dynamic DNS feature every time you request a DHCP v6 address. For example if the prefix changes as in the future it will be dynamic it would result in an updated DNS record. Together with a short time to live, this would actually work, but I didn't like the thought of going all in on DHCP v6. Even in v4 networks, I would not rely on DHCP, especially for, for hosts that I would normally configure statically. So uh, another option, I came up with was to just root all my static IP addresses or at least a part of it in, into my home network and just assign hosts static IP addresses that are well from a different site actually. So I didn't like that thought either. Um, I think I would gain some kind of a dependency and I don't want such dependencies. The third option, I mean, there are maybe more options actually, but um, the next best thing I came up with was just to use unique local addresses for my hosts in my home network, which of course are not rootable in the internet, but they don't have to be because I think in only very rare cases I actually contact any hosts at home from from some point of the internet and if I do I would use a VPN tunnel also WireGuard and in that case I could I could talk to them even if I come with a global unicast address in my VPN tunnel for my road warrior I would be able to access hosts in my home network that run unique local addresses so you can talk um, from from global unicast addresses to to unique local addresses but you cannot do that when when traffic passes over over public routers because they won't they won't transport stuff like that actually went into that direction and there there and there were some bumps along the road i would like to show what my experiences were and maybe you can gain from them and well um make less mistakes than i have done well i i would have to come up with an idea about how to do addressing with my hosts. Of course, there are some hosts like like mobile mobile phones and stuff like that. They they will just uh, get their I IP address via a static um, stateless autoconf or like DHCP. Maybe maybe uh, autoconf with privacy extensions, I guess. Uh, but some hosts I wanted to give a static IP address so I can I can talk to them for example when I want a host in my data center to contact a host in my home network or when I want to contact a host in my home network when I'm on the road and connected via VPN. I said I will assign EULA addresses statically on those hosts at my home network but there is the other aspect to that because EULA won't talk to the internet, so they also would need a stateless or stateful uh, dynamically assigned address as well from the global unicast address base, which is internet routable. So I would try to implement a strategy where my hosts actually uh, get, get a static assignment in the unique local address space and uh, on top of that also a global unicast address that can talk to the internet because most of the hosts in my home network actually want to talk to the internet. Well, guess what? And the differences between all the systems, I mean, I run like Alpine Linux, I, I run Debian, I run FreeBSD, I run, I run uh, oh, Mac OS and, and all the different kinds of operating systems. I have switches and printers and stuff like that. And every single one of them them is is cooking their own soup like uh, i don't know it's a german saying i tr just translated into english i hope you get it um it's it's really a pain i would have to say uh there this is one point where ipv6 is not really as mature as it should be 
so well i mean it it actually works but uh, you have to put a little bit of thought and a little bit of work into it another thing is that that i'm used to my prefix ip address uh, prefix and i don't want it to start to remember all new prefixes and all new addresses so i said i would introduce a eula prefix that is exactly the same as my um, global unicast prefix i mean this is not the actual one but uh, this is just for demonstration purposes so only the first two characters are different but the rest is the same so it would ease up a little bit the pain next is i needed to make some adjustments to the side to side tunnel um, and also for the road warrior tunnel so the side to side tunnel uh, side to side tunnel i added the unique local address space it seemed to work i mean uh, hosts in my data center were able to contact hosts at my home using the um, eula address as a destination ip but next thing uh, was my road warrior setup so when i'm on my way with my laptop for example i need a possibility to connect to my home network and for that I'm using a WireGuard Road Warrior setup and this one also needed to have some adjustments like uh, the allowed IPs I'm showing right here. So my, my Road, Road Warrior uh, clients were also able to connect to the Eula addresses at my home network because I'm going through the data center. I, I connect to the data center when I'm uh, on the road and through the WireGuard tunnel peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, through the side to side wireguard tunnel i'm going to the home network as well and, and this kind of worked but well i needed some firewall adjustments and <laughs> i mean in the end it was a really painful process um and i think i can i can ease the pain for you if if i can convince you to use ula in the first place i needed to make some firewall adjustments as well I need to make some some routing adjustments, firewall adjustments, uh, VPN tunnel adjustments, and I as I'm using Ansible, this was well quite of a easy quite of an easy process. But I figured that I have had too many hard coded IP addresses and too many hard coded network prefixes in my configuration files, and uh i wanted to rely even stronger on what i am already doing with ansible and netbox so i wrote a new pl uh, no, not a playbook but a new role that would fetch all my prefixes that are stored in the netbox database and put them into the ansible collection um well i will also put a link into the description if you're interest interested in that one and uh, well i mean after that things were a little bit better but here comes one of the biggest problem i was facing throughout the whole process which was uh, in in case a host in my home network would try to contact some host in my remote network at the data center uh, and here is a diagram showing that very problem so we have a home vm for example here who is trying to connect a data center vm on the uh, journey it just uses its uh, global unicast dynamic address as a source address because that's just how the RFCs work, I guess. I don't, I haven't read them um, actually, but it turns out my hosts constantly were using the global unicast address space uh, using as a source address. Packages go from my home VM over the home firewall, data center firewall to the data center VM. And this very host wanted to send an answer package and they switch source and destination IP address as the VPN tunnel, the side-to-side -side VPN tunnel uh, declaration doesn't contain the global unicast dynamic address space, uh, address space of my home network as this will be dynamic. The data didn't make it back to my home network because uh, the tunnel description doesn't contain the, the prefix so the data went over the, over the plain internet. And as my home firewall doesn't have firewall rules for that, it shouldn't, and I, I don't want them to be there. And as the home firewall also doesn't have fitting state information about that returning traffic, it just would drop it. So communication breakdown. <laughs> 
and I came up with a solution. I asked in the Reddit IPv6 thread about what they thought might be a good approach to that. They came up with different stuff. I don't want to name everything because some of those uh, approaches are not worth mentioning, but uh, for one possibility, which is uh, just use masquerading. So at the time when the originating data pr uh, traverses the home firewall, it could replace the source address so that when the data traverses back, it goes th it would go through the tunnel again and then uh, to the home firewall and then again being reverse nutted so that the data actually would flow. This, I guess, would work. I'm quite sure it would, but I don't like masquerading at all. It is very hard to debug and it also slows down the network a little bit. It would be sufficient, I guess, but I didn't like it. I thought I needed to come up with a better solution. Another uh, approach was to also use EULA addresses in the data center. I mean, I don't know actually if in case of a host in the home network and a host in the data center network both having ULA addresses, if actually the source address would again be ULA. Because, I, I mean, I think when uh, the destination address is ULA, the, the, the process of the source address selection might be a little bit different. I do not know actually and I didn't read about that but uh, I didn't like the idea either because I want my IP addresses to uh, I mean I want my DNS records for my data center to point to the global unicast address so I went with an approach that utilizes a dynamic routing protocol I actually tried FRR and Quagga and stuff like that but I ended up using Babel daemon and I would like to show you if you have just some more minutes. So this is the situation with dynamic routing. You can see that the traffic flows in both directions. I mean, in the scenario where the home network computer or VM initiates the traffic, it will flow through the wireguard tunnel even if it even even uh, if the data r returns, and it will also will go beyond the home firewall. Uh, why is that? I mean. Um, I wanted to have a root information on the remote firewall. So the remote firewall knows that, okay, if traffic needs to go back to the, to the home network, to the global unicast dynamic address space, that it should run through, through the WireGuard tunnel. And in order to achieve that, I thought I could use dynamic routing so that those two firewalls would exchange their networks and it actually ended up working very well. Here are some some changes I needed to make because in the original state, the wildcard side to side tunnel would have uh, distinct definitions about the allowed IP addresses. So, what IP addresses are allowed to go through the tunnel? This is this parameter. This is a new configuration actually uh, after the changes. Um, before the changes, there were a, li a list of uh, um, subnets I am using on both sides in there. And I also had the option root allowed IP set to one. So this would lead to a VPN tunnel side to side, knowing what IP addresses are on both sides and installing routes for both sides and also allowing traffic. So um, in a situation where both ends actually are static, this is very fine. But um, as I wanted to go dynamic on one side on my home network, I needed to change the list of allowed IPs to 000, zero, zero, zero uh, for v4. This is every host, uh, every possible IP address there is. And this is the same for IPv6 here, list of allowed IPs. And I needed to add, I, I mean, I needed to change the root allowed IPs to zero because uh, the, the VPN tunnel itself shouldn't create root information, but the dynamic routing protocol would do that. Another thing is uh, the configuration of the Babel daemon. So the interface, uh, the WireGuard interface for the side to side actually is called rx 4 This is the example for my home network. This is actually not what I'm, I will be using in, in the production environment uh, regarding the IPs, but uh, this is just for demonstration. So I have a, a, a EULA 
uh, prefix here and here is the global prefix. I have not yet switched to the fiber connection. My prefix right now actually is static. I wanted to leave it in a functioning state, of course. This is the configuration for that. Uh, so uh, after the change to a dynamic prefix, this would be different. I would add like uh, instead of the global, u global unicast uh, prefix here, I would probably add all the address space the Deutsche Telekom provider has. So I don't know what prefix they're going to give me, but it will be within 32-bit prefix size. And this actually ended up working. What's happening, I have a tunnel between both sides and there is no restrictions whatsoever on what IPs may run through the tunnel. I mean, except of course from, from the routing rules that get implemented. And of course, apart from the firewall packet filter settings, they still filter out packets that do not belong there. So I'm getting a tunnel restricting no IP addresses and installing no root information. And to replace that, I installed Babel daemon on both sides, which would communicate with each other over the WireGuard tunnel with IPv6 multicast and exchange root information. And those filter rules here limit what kind of routing information may be interchanged or will be accepted. This is the result. So global unicast dynamic IP address as a source address will be used again uh, in a case of where a home network PC will try to reach someone on the remote data center site. And this time the traffic is running through the tunnel even when returning and also passing on through the firewall at my home network. Yeah, and I am very lucky with that. So I will have a situation where I'm using ULA prefix IP addresses for my DNS records when I would like to contact some host in my home network. So I have a static situation over there. And I mean, uh, the other way around when I, I need to contact some remote PC in the data center, originating from my home network. This is what I have been talking about all the time. This little corner case where some public people would try to contact some host in my home network. Well, this is a little bit different. I mean, I had been running some Minecraft servers or stuff like that. This I can do with dynamic DNS. So even if the prefix changes, I will run a load TTL and then update the DNS record and everything is fine once again. Well, except from IPv4, I guess, but I don't care so much about IPv4 anymore. I think this is a more com comforting situation, especially even if I one day will again change my provider, I won't have to do s bigger changes on my network because I will have my static unique local address space. I have dynamic routing that will adjust to new IP addresses, even if they come from a from a new provider, I would have to make some little adjustments to the to the to the filter rule for the Babel D routing algorithm. But that's basically it. I have gained a lot of flexibility and I kept my static IP addresses and DNS records for being able to manage my home hosts, like for example, accessing the switches uh, web GUI in order to make some configuration changes would be still working. And my final words is use unique local address space. I mean, if you are in the position of, of running full BGP, your own autonomous system number, you won't run into any problems like I have. But even if you just start using IPv6, there are even experts that would suggest not to use unique local address space. But I do, and I strongly suggest you do. It will not result in too much work. For example, if you use OpenWRT, you can just define a default ULA prefix and it will automatically assign your host with, a, with an IP. And you could, for example, uh, if, the, if you need to have some static assignments, you can do that and you can uh, connect them to DNS records as well. Uh, but especially if you are in a case like I am right now, so meaning you are in a static environment and you are going to a, to a dynamic one, this will result in a lot of work if you haven't decided to go ULA from the beginning. 
this has actually been one of my longer videos and I'm really sorry if you got bored but if you made it to the end thank you very much for watching I would really like if you gave me a thumbs up I really put a lot of effort into this one well I mean I like doing that of course but I like it even better if I get a little bit of appreciation so thank you very much see you next time bye bye